Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, I'm Barbara. I'm an alcoholic. Uh, welcome, everyone. This new to Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, welcome to all of us that are keep coming back so we can give it away to the person that comes through that door. Uh, I know that if I don't stick around, then uh, when the newcomer comes through the door, the room's empty. And uh, when I got sober, I came through the door and there was a bunch of you. And I found my home. I really did. Um, my sobriety date is August 16, 1992. My home group is the West Portland group. Um, my sponsor is Michael E., the girl. I don't know, Michael. And uh, she has a sponsor, and her sponsor has a sponsor, and so forth. And I also sponsor women. And um, my grand sponsor says those are the things that you need to be in good standing in Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, I was told that from the podium that you tell what it was like, what happened, what it's like now. And I was also told to dress like a lady. Um, because that, what that represents to the people that are coming in that are new, um, it's not that I want to wear bling bling and make you feel less than or, you know, anything like that. It's to show that I have self-respect now. And um, as a woman in Alcoholics Anonymous, um, at my second meeting, a man came up to me and said, um, so are you married, engaged, you know, anything like that? And I said, actually, I'm engaged. And he said, huh, well, I don't need to waste my time with you anymore. And I'll tell you something, not cool. <laughs> you know, that's that's not cool. I mean, it's funny because it is funny, but it is not cool because um, fortunately I had been told ahead of time to worry about that kind of stuff. It's just human beings in here. But, um, you know, fortunately I, I was actually engaged with someone who had sobriety and Alcoholics Anonymous. And it was important for me to know that these rooms are where I come to not die. And I have a terminal progressive disease, and it's alcoholism. And um, it's not a laughing matter. However, we do laugh a lot, but um, it's very important for me to honor the traditions and honor um, the program that saved my life. And I'm so grateful that, you know, the women surrounded me and that the men, and that's the only man that's ever done that, by the way, ever. Um, from that point on in 14 plus years of sobriety, all of you men have been extremely respectful and kind and, and considerate and, you know, 50% of my recovery. So what it was like. I was born. <laughs> you have to do that to be here. Um, <laughs> um, uh, in Fremont, California, my um, uh, which is in the South Bay um, from San Francisco, I lived in San Jose, and my father is an alcoholic. He says he's an alcoholic. He's currently seven months dry. He went to three Alcoholics Anonymous meetings and decided that um, he's not an alcoholic like we are. And, uh, which is so classic because this is the disease that I have that says your case is different. They don't understand. Poor, poor Barbie. Pour me another drink and out the door I go. And I understand that because I have this disease. And God bless him. At least he's not on the streets drunk. Um, and I'm, the deer are grateful for that out in Bend and, and I'm sure the locals are too. Um, but, um, I have a, a wonderful mother who is a raging codependent and, uh, she, proceeded to raise my father, and then got pregnant with me and started to raise me. So she had two kids, one she was married to and one that she gave birth to. And uh, that was in 1964. There was a, a beautiful, we were just pre hippiedom and uh, there was a, and I've always looked like this. I, I really fit in in the 60s and 70s, but I just haven't had the heart to cut my hair out. I always just looked like this. I fit in back then. And um, from my earliest memory, uh, like I have always been, I was just, terminally shy, very, very shy, and I would throw just complete conniption fits. If someone would give me something at Christmas, my mom would say, thank you, Auntie Carol, and I'd be like, huh. and she's like, Barbie, go thank her, no, you know, and I actually would draw more attention and negativity by throwing that fit, but I, I was so paralyzed with this fear of stepping outside of myself, this fear that, you know, if I walked into a room and a couple of kids giggled over in the corner, I knew they were laughing at me. I knew they were judging me. And uh, and I thought, you know, at a very young age, you know, I don't know what the words were, but it was basically, screw you, you know. Um, and so my world from the very beginning was very small. It was very small. And um, we moved to, get this, 
my parents didn't like the hippies, so we moved to Oregon. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> that is that's the result of good homework on my father's part. And um, we moved to the Oregon coast, even. Um, <laughs> communes, people living in TVs, and, uh, and there we are. Um, living on the Oregon coast, and my father's disease continued to progress, and so did mine. Uh, my experiences, and, and this is my belief for me, and just so you know, this is just my experience. This is my story. You don't have to agree with it. You don't have to like it. I'm an alcoholic. I know I'm an alcoholic, and I'm sober, and, and because of that, I have this amazing life. So the only one in this room that has to believe I'm drunk is me. Um, and so my disease was progressing as well at that point. Um, my dad liked to do kind of a extramarital research. And uh, just to see if there's anything better out there, and uh, and of course there always was. And he fell in love with my mom's best friend, and um, my mom didn't like that. She said, "Where?" And uh, <laughs> and so we decided to move to um, we moved from North Bend to Coos Bay, then we moved from Coos Bay to Grant Pass. And uh, this gal that had fallen in love with my father, she talked her husband into moving to Grant Pass. So for one year, my dad was sort of. Um, on the straight and narrow, and then they moved to Grants Pass, and it all began again. And consequently, um, she said, if you leave Barbie and my mother, I'll leave my husband and my kids. And my dad went straight home and packed his bags and left, and that woman went straight home and cooked dinner. And so she's still married to that husband, and my father is no longer in our family. And so my parents finally divorced, and my mom was convinced that there was the solution because I had always been so just kind of sideways and kind of volatile and, and just, you know, just not a normal kid. I was not happy, joyous, and free, that's for sure. And I see kids today, and I have a little niece, and she's almost a year and a half, and she's the center of attention, and she's just full of life. And, I mean, back then, if anybody acknowledged me, I just would whew, shut down, just, you know. And the only time I really felt comfortable is if I had some candy in my system, strangely enough. And seriously, I was a serious sugar seeker. And so I had a little bit of comfort in that. So they divorced, and in that year after they divorced, um, we went to a wedding reception, or somewhere a year or two after they divorced. We went to a wedding reception, and there was a bunch of kids there, and one was really popular, so I thought his name was Dennis. And my mom was over-socializing, and Dennis, the kids were all in the kitchen. He pushed a beer across the table in a nice, mm, I had romantic feelings towards glass you know, towards cups, towards, you know, the sound of crystal and ice tinkling in it. I, I feel, mm. and uh, And he pushed that beer <laughs> towards me, my first crush. And I, I was like, hmm, and I knew I wasn't supposed to, but who cares? Dennis was acknowledging me. And, while, and right before he did that, I felt, and I remember this like it was yesterday, and they say only alcoholics remember their first drink. Not everybody does, but only alcoholics remember their first drink. My mom doesn't remember her first dip, her first nothing. Um, there's a speaker that says, that's like remembering your first taco. You know, I mean, it doesn't make sense. I don't remember my first taco, but I remember my first drink. And uh, when that came across the table, I took a gulp out of it because I wanted to get it in before my mom saw me. And about a third of the, of the way through, give or take, um, it it was actually a physical, tra- I physically felt the alcohol. I can feel it right now. It went up my back and out my arm. And all of a sudden, my shoulders went, Hunk. and I remember thinking, Dennis isn't that popular. <laughs> you know, I mean, <laughs> the whole room just flipped. And, uh, <laughs> you know, in fact, he's lucky I'm here. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that's, and, and all of a sudden, I mean, <laughs> the vista opened up, and I was free. For the first time in my life, I felt comfortable being inside of here. For the first time in my life. And um, my mother, who had, you know, raised that alcoholic husband, uh, she has like about a 15-minute, you know, circle. She would like, you know, peruse the room. And so it was about 15 minutes, and, and she saw me from across the room. And that woman bolted across that room, ripped me out of that chair, threw me in the car. She was livid because her thought was, if alcohol gets in this kid, oh, my God, she might become alcoholic. What she didn't realize is that my life had just been saved. For, for them, that I had found the solution that would allow me to go on to be a cheerleader, to be in sports, to perform music, to dance, to go to concerts, to have sex, to socialize, to interact with the world at large. She didn't know that I had just found my solution 
to walk amongst the earth people, to feel like I fit in here on the planet. But she was not happy. And she took me home, and uh, she put me in my room, which I don't understand why that's a bad thing, you know. And I got some stereos there, you know. And I put on my headset, and I fell asleep to this group called The Cars, and they had a song called Moving in Stereo, and it was a really cool thing back then. It moved from headphone to headphone. And it would go, life is the same, it's moving in stereo. And I fell asleep to that, and I had found what I would obsess on for the next 12 years. There was not a waking moment that I was not thinking about where I was going to get my next drink. And so I made it through high school, um, I, every, and, and it took so much effort. I had a code of conduct, I was a cheerleader, and I was all, and I, I didn't care. I was willing to lose. Who cares, quite frankly, um, what you're going to lose? To me, if someone could have, if they would have said, prioritize your life, God, your mom, you know, extracurricular stuff, drinking, drinking, no question about it. I love the taste of beer. I love the taste of tequila. I love mixed drinks. I puked on everything else. But I still drink it if that's all you had at the party. Um, I tried some drugs, and they didn't do it for me. Alcohol got me there where I was comfortable. And for me, drugs made me, you know, he's looking at me, you know, paranoid. And I, I don't want to feel that, you know. That's just the way my body metabolized it. Alcohol allowed me to feel normal, I guess. And um, I went to college, and I went to Southern Oregon University, which was Southern Oregon State College, party school. Yeah, I'm kidding. And uh, it was the only school I could really get into. I had no intention of going to classes. I had no desire to achieve anything. I could care less. I went to college specifically to party and be free of that hawk, my mother, who only wanted the best for me. And uh, I went there, and um, and barely, it took me five years to do a four-year program. I went to a couple other colleges. I did geographics within my college career. And in that time frame, I met a guy that I um, really thought was good-looking. And uh, it turns out he was a drunk. Now, my dad's good-looking, and he's a drunk. And I'd only made one promise to myself in my life. No good-looking male drunk. No, no. That's not a good combination, because if you do that, then he's doing all that, right? And I didn't want to be involved with that. And so this guy, he was so easy on the eyes. And I thought, eh, maybe I can change him. Ever thought of that? <laughs> he'll, he'll change for me, you know. You guys know how probable that is. And, uh, and you know, out of the gates, a lot of people can change initially. And I told him, the one thing you can't do, though, is please don't come over my apartment wasted. And he came over one time just plotto. He was always drunk, but this time he was, like, probably blackout just. And um, I was up on the veranda. I said, don't, I told you never to come to my apartment drunk. He says, I'm always effing drunk. You know, and he walked off. And, of course, I was like, I love you. You know, I just was <laughs> um, but there was a part of me that was afraid, you know, that, and so, and, and he was upset with that because, you know, there was no way that was going to happen. And not long after that, someone knocked at my door and I opened it and there was an entire human being, six foot five human being, filling the door and it was his father. And uh, I had some of this guy's things and his father said, Chris has gone into treatment, I need his few pieces of clothing. And, um, and this young man had gone into treatment. Um, shortly after that, he finally got sober, and he got sober in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. And it was so weird because um, we started playing tennis. He was like, actually, it's like a vampire that got cured, you know. It's like all of a sudden he started showing up in the daylight, and we started doing, like, daylight things. And it was so weird, and, and it was so interesting because he'd, like, disappear when the sun would set, and, uh, and that's when I would come to life. I've always considered myself a night owl. I like the nighttime because that's when you drink. And then I came here and learned I could have drank all day. I didn't even know that was an option. So <laughs> I hope I never relapse because there's, I have too much information now about what we can do out there. And um, anyway, this guy stayed sober in Alcoholics Anonymous. And when he was six months sober, I graduated college and I moved to Southern California. And I had always said, you know what the problem is? It's Oregon. It's Oregon. You know, I need to be back in California. I'm a California girl. Um, and I didn't know that in my mind everything was a geographic. Everything was, it's not, it's never me. It's always the place, it's the apartment building, it's the manager of the apartment building, it's the person I'm dating, it's the professors, it's my parents, it's, it's never me. And the only common denominator in all the crap in my life was me. But I could not see that. And so I moved to Southern California and, um, absolutely nothing changed except that I started kind of going like this, down, down, down. All the things that I considered a non-breachable boundary, eh, 
well, eh, you know, oh, well, I did that. Well, oh, what I meant was, you know, you know. Um, and I started doing the things that alcoholic women do. It wasn't overly promiscuous, but by my values, I did things that I should not have done. Um, I did things that you as alcoholic women know that you can never change. Um, I should be a mother. You know what that means. And I'm not. I don't have any children. Um, and I did all these things that were so contrary to my value system. And my world started to get so ugly. And um, during this time, I stayed in touch with this guy up in Oregon. And uh, and he just kept kind of – and so and so I'm going down, and he's going up. And he's like a loser. He's an alcoholic loser. He didn't graduate college. You know, I have all this judgment. Because I'm thinking all these things are going to make me somebody. You know, A plus B equals C, doesn't it? That's what it's doing for everyone else. How come I graduated college and I'm a loser? I keep losing jobs. I keep quitting jobs. What do you mean I have to wear eyelashes? I quit. You know, so it's like, what I mean, that's ridiculous, you know. None of the rules apply to me whatsoever. And um, anyway, I got hooked up with this really marvelous guy. He had hair longer than mine. He was prettier than me, and he spent more time on himself aesthetically than I did. And uh, the man would not get a job, would not get a real job. And um, he used to always say, you know, I know what I want to be, so I don't need to work. I need to pursue that. And we were in Hollywood, and so everybody was doing, you know, and we had the motorcycle, and we both had the long hair, and we'd go down and hang out on the strip and go to the troubadour and the whiskey, and, you know, and we thought we were all that, and I was miserable. And I had all this facade of hips looking cool, but inside, I mean, I was dying. I was absolutely dying. And uh, we had a really neat relationship. Every single day, I would go to work, and I would be crying, and I would be bruised. He would be bruised. I'm a girl that got hit, and I'm a girl that hit. So I could never say, oh, I'm a victim. Forget about it. I'm an engager. Let's engage. Let's get it on. You know, I'm five foot nine, man. This is, you know, and I'm an alcoholic and I'm ticked. I don't know why, but I'm pretty angry about something. And the only thing I loved about this guy is that he never said diddly about my drinking. Not diddly. And he expected when I was cooking at night that I would finish off a couple bottles of wine because he came from a family where some of that was acceptable. So I was very grateful for that part of that young man. Uh, in this little time period, um, I was down there almost five years, this guy Chris called me, and he, and I had gone to hang out with a friend down in Laguna Hills. We would come home about 2, 3 in the morning, <clears throat> and she was the girl that would always say, I'll drive us home, because she was like six feet tall. She looked like Anna Nicole Smith. This woman was hot. She was so fine. I mean, she made me kind of question, hmm, girl, you know. And, uh, <laughs> and I'll tell you, she could hold her liquor. This woman, she, she made me look like a wussy. But that particular night, she had said, uh, she pulled over uh, on the 405, and she was like, or 605, and she said, I, I think you have to drive. And I thought, You've got to be kidding. I mean, there was the one eye, you know, where's the peanut butter, follow the line, keep the air conditioning on, the windows down, music going, type of driving, which was nothing new to me. And I never got a DUI, ever. I don't know how, because I always, always, always was a designated driver. And what I've learned about alcohol is that I metabolized it in such a way that, quite honestly, when I would start to really get wasted, is when you remove the alcohol. That's when I would start to crash and really start to feel like I, I couldn't control. So... So long as it was a pint in the car or something, it was good to go. So um, we got home, and this guy called her house, you know, as we were standing there, and he said, I'm in, I'm in Oregon. And he used to call me all the time and say, I'm downstairs. I'm in Santa Monica. I'm in, and this is this good-looking drunk that, you know, at this point is five and a half years sober in Alcoholics Anonymous. And he says, uh, my dad and I, my little brother, we want to come over and see you, da, da, da. Okay. And uh, I thought, oh, my God, Chris, Chris, you know. Daddy's sober. Yeah, I'm sure he'll get over that, you know, because I really thought <laughs> that, you know, all you had did in AA was learn how to drink like a gentleman. And um, and so he came to um, Laguna Hills, and he got out of the car, and I've never been a romantic. I never wanted white picket fence. I never had a hope chest. I wasn't a girl. I never dreamt of having children. I did not think I'd live to see 30. There was, that just wasn't even, you know, I had no expectations of life whatsoever. And I was doing stupider and stupider things, hanging out with, you know, the doorman at my building where I worked in Westwood was this big, huge black man, and he has missing half his jaw from a drive-by shooting, and really nice guy, and, and his name was Guy. So he's a nice guy, <laughs> and literally. And he said to me, because I was always so miserable, he said, you know, I got a couple friends. Take care of that boyfriend for you for cheap. And I paused. Hmm. 
how much money do I have in my savings? To me, that's how you don't break up with a boy. You hire someone to eliminate the boy. That's the way I was thinking. And that's where my life had gotten to, and I swear to God I considered it. How do you dispose of the body and get the blood to not be in the – I mean, I wish CSI was back then. Maybe I could have figured it out. But um, So this guy, Chris, showed up, and he got out of his car, and it was with my friend, Anna Nicole, and uh, I physically felt – like something shot through the top of my head, and I thought, oh, my God, I'm going to marry Chris. So alcoholic. And maybe maybe it was God and the angels, and who the heck knows. But, and so I followed him back to Oregon. And a uh, poor guy was just visiting his dad, and I, you know, kind of like, you know, uh, just glommed on because my mind was like, this is miserable. That's the solution. And it was always something outside of myself. So uh, I went home on my lunch break. I moved out all my stuff. Uh, called my boyfriend and said, ha, you don't have anywhere to live, you know, um, and, and I didn't care. I was the breadwinner. Good luck to you. And I moved to Oregon, and um, within less than probably three weeks, I don't know, major, major blur, brownout, uh, the cops had been called on us. Um, I had tried to jump out of the car, kind of a theatric, like I'm going to hurt myself. You know, like I want to get that kind of burn on my body, but I'm going to make him think I'm going to jump out of the car because it's all about scaring the guy because if I scare you enough, won't you love me more? Don't you think if we're super crazy, you guys will love us more? Hell no. That doesn't make any sense at all. But somehow I thought that would evoke love from him. I'm going to jump, GD. And he's like, fine, jump. You know, he's sober, you know, and I took this man hostage. He was five and a half years sober, and I'll tell you something. When I went to college, uh, I had lettered in tennis in high school, but I got kicked off because I said the F word. But they gave me a letter anyway because someone drank on another team. But anyway, I played tennis, and when I went to college, I played with a bunch of kids that they were horrible. And I was like, I lettered in tennis. I'm all that. And I, I sucked. And they're like, yeah, whatever. You're full of it. Well, what I realized is that I play down in my game. Whenever I'm around someone that's like here, I don't, they don't rise up to me. I play down every single time, and this guy was hanging out with a practicing alcoholic, psychotic, straight from the streets of Hollywood, little girl, 28 years old, and I was a friggin' loon. And he may have been five and a half years sober, but I'm telling you right now, because I have some of my babies, they're like, I love him. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, one, you know, you have two weeks of sobriety. You think you got enough going on? What are you bringing to the table that's actually going to allow this situation to work? That's not going to cause a cosmic, you know. And so this poor man said to me after the cops and called, I mean, his life was nuts, though, with me in it. And he dared to eat the last of a giant Hershey bar I had. And I threw the mother of all fit. I was to the moon, put my fist through the wall, which I'd done many, many times. I kicked a um, little stereo thing out of the floor and shattered it. And I mean, I was so angry. How dare he? He knows that I need that. I love that stuff. Whatever. I would have shared if he would have asked. I mean, I was losing my ever-loving mind over my Hershey bar. And what I didn't realize is that I was, I said to him when I moved to Portland, I just won't drink. I don't even know what the big deal is. I won't drink. He said, oh, you can drink. I mean, because he didn't realize I drank as much as I drank. And he said, but don't drink in my home. I said, oh, no, I won't drink at all. What's the big deal? And within three weeks, I was certifiably insane. I was insane. No prospect of drinking. If I drank, I would lose him. If, um, you know, I, I, I had never, ever been so uncomfortable in my whole life. And, um, he, you know, he said, we need to move and, <clears throat> I said, okay, and I went to, he said, you need to get boxes to move. Funny little thing that happens with moving. you got to put your stuff in a box. And I was like, oh, but that's Fred Meyer. I can't go to Fred Meyer. If I have to ask for boxes and they don't have them, that's embarrassing. And if they have boxes, I have to carry them, and that's embarrassing. Um, we've got grocery bags. We'll, we'll move that way. So we move with grocery bags. I challenge you to move with grocery bags and not get shin splints if you live on the third floor. And so here we are, no elevator. It's, it's, it's moving our stuff, and it took. And I, I asked a friend to help us move. And at the end of that day, he said, "I don't even know if I want to be your friend anymore. You are completely insane." And I thought, "I don't understand what the problem is." That's how alcoholism can manifest for me—just an absolute shrinking of the world. And and it, if you try to explain it to a non-alcoholic, they're just like, "I mean, I swear I've tried to explain myself to non-alcoholics, and they go like this." Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
And I tell you guys, and you're like, tell me more, you know? And that's why I stay here. You guys get me. And um, so Chris said to me that night when I threw the fit over my Hershey bar, and it was justified, and he said, it was like 2 in the morning, and I was just vibrating with rage. It wasn't the Hershey bar, and you guys know that. It was that I was so uncomfortable. My solution was gone, and I had no replacement. There was nothing to replace what had been my solution, and I didn't know that. And he said, geez, Barb, if you were to drink, what would you do? Because he's still kind of the light just flickering, like, oh, my God. And at the time, we're engaged, you know, we've known each other for many, many years. And <clears throat> I said, hmm, I don't know how to find my way to the bank. But I said, oh, I'd go down to Santa Fe, have a double-shot corporal gold with the beer back, and I'd head over to the Mission Theater, and I'd have a picture of Darth Barron, because I like to go out and be in public if I drink, because that allows me to be social. And uh, <clears throat> and I can see him right now in my mind's eye. He was just kind of like, uh-huh. And uh, what would your mom do if she's torn off drinking? My mom's not an alcoholic. She's never sworn off drinking. Non-alcoholics don't swear off drinking. You know, that's like me swearing off friggin' orange juice. You know, it's just not necessary. It's not a problem. And um, I said my mom would have a grasshopper. It was just some skanky, nasty green drink that she used to let evaporate. And um, <laughs> and I'm an evaporation monitor. And um, she, uh, she, you know, not a problem. She, she'd drink that part, part way and then she'd leave. And he said, what would your father do? And like I said, my dad says he's an alcoholic, so I'm not judging him or taking his inventory. And um, I said, my dad would probably go to Santa Fe, have a double shot, purple gold, and a beer back, and then he'd head to the mission. And I stopped short, and I had my moment of clarity. I got a moment of clarity. And I looked at Chris, and I said, oh, oh, my God, am I an alcoholic? It had never, ever occurred to me. And that's not to say people haven't said it or threatened me with it or, you know, kind of, have you ever considered, but I heard it coming from me, out of me. And he said, I, I can't tell you that. This, this is a self-diagnosed disease. If you've got it, you have to make that decision. And um, he said, I suggest you call the hotline, Alcoholics Anonymous. And I called the hotline, and the man on the other line, other end sounded like he was older than God, which was cool because there was, it, there was a sense of comfort there. And, and uh, he, I said, my name's Barbara, and I don't know why I'm calling. And I just, you know, I mean, I was just like vibrating. And, and I was relieved. And just as quickly as I was relieved, I was terrified. Because what do you do with that? What do you do with that information? Everyone in my family has been destroyed by this disease. And now I've got it? Why I thought I dodged that bullet, I don't know. But I guess it's because, you know, their lives all blew up. Well, of course they did. They're 20, 40, 60 years older than me, you know. That was my yet. I, I would have gotten there eventually. And my life wasn't like it was lighting up the sky anyway. And uh, and he said, you know, just settle down. He says, well, what do you want to do? And I don't know if he meant, you know, do you want to go to meetings? Do you want to go to treatment? Do you want to... And I said, I just want an effing drink. I didn't say effing, but you know what I mean. And uh, I tell you what, all I could think was, if I could just get a few drinks, then I can figure this out. I can, I can get a handle on what I need to do. And I've been told non-alcoholics don't say that. Dang it. You know, everywhere I was shutting the little hole, the, you know, loophole, everywhere that I could have said, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but. It was just closing up. And uh, he said, I suggest you get to an A and I said, well, you know, I'm engaged to this wonderful man who has five and a half years who's in the other room talking to his sponsor and, uh, you know, <laughs> looking out, you know, he's got a ring, oh, my God, you know. And um, the next day I walked up to the Alano Club, Alano, I call it Alano. I don't know. No one taught me how to say it. And um, I went into my, my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. I had been with Chris a couple of times. I thought, those poor, poor losers, they can't drink, whatever, you know, how sad. Um, because I didn't understand that it wasn't just not drinking. I didn't understand that I had a mental, I have a mental condition, that I am bodily and mentally different than my fellows. And um, I went to the Alana Club. I sat down on the on the couch closest to the door. And, um, I mean, I was coming out of my skin. I had fingernail polish on. And by the end of the meeting, I had almost all of it off. Because, I mean, I was coming out of my skin. And they said, is there anyone here in the first, second, or third meeting? And I was like, and they said, can we have your name? You know, and I was like, Barbara? You know, and, then, and they're like, well, welcome, Barbara. And then a couple other people said, no, I'm an alcoholic. I thought, oh, I didn't do it right, you know, but I didn't believe that I was alcoholic, per se. There's alcoholic, and then there's like, alcoholic. And I was this one, you know. But I stayed in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I'll tell you what happened. That very first meeting, everybody in there 
has shifted the whole the whole purpose of the meeting. Everybody started talking to me. Thought I was going to vomit, but I also I heard them, you know. And uh, every single person was like, you know, I always felt different than apart from and not good enough. I always felt like, you know, I was on the outside looking in. I had this horrible shyness. I was debilitated by fear and anxiety and panic and, you know, alcohol. Voila, smooth. Took all the rough edges off. I was okay. And I just, I thought, what? I mean, I heard the music, you know. The laughter came later, but boy, I'll tell you what, you guys spoke directly to me. You saved my life. You saved my life. And I, and still it took me a couple of years to really believe I was alcoholic. What an amazing disease that sits there and tells you with all evidence to the contrary, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, you know, but, Barb, you really were a blackout drunk. Oh, okay, you know, is that, does it say that in the first 164 pages? You know, that's not a prerequisite. That's not what alcohol, it doesn't have to be that. And I, my sponsor never had a blackout. She always says, and I get to remember every pitiful and disgusting thing I ever did. And that's my story. Every little nasty, disgusting little compromise right up here. And then it went straight on the paper, you know. Um, so you guys saved my life. You gave me your phone numbers. A couple guys gave me their phone numbers. And uh didn't call them, but it was very sweet, and I think they had good intentions. And there's nothing wrong with that. But for me, the women saved my life. And they surrounded me, and they said, when are you going to your next meeting? They marked all these meetings. Okay, we'll see you here tomorrow. And I was like, what? You know, what do you mean tomorrow? I mean, I got a busy schedule. I got to get up. You know? <laughs> I had absolutely no life whatsoever. I did not have a job. Um, my car kept getting tickets because my registration was expired and had California plates, and you know how we love Californians up here. And, uh, you know, I had nothing, nothing on the horizon. My life was, was just nothing. And uh, so I went back, and I continued to go back, and I don't fully understand why I continued to stay in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous except to say I didn't have any other ideas. I just, I, and I realized that for me to drink would be for me to have that life refunded. And I can honestly say that there was something in me that said, do you want to be that? Is that it? Because if that's it, girl, you might as well take a bullet and put it through your brain. Because that is not a life. And it was continuing to get uglier and uglier. So I stayed in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. I did my steps. I didn't ask someone to officially be my sponsor. But I did the steps. Because they said a girl, and I was like, girls are the enemy, enemy, I don't trust them, they steal boyfriends, they, you know. And the reality is, is that, you know, I just was unwilling to go to any lengths. And I mean, I'm one of those lucky people that did half majors and did not drink again. But boy, let me tell you, I was really, really edgy. I was not comfortable. And at about two years of sobriety, I had whittled my world down to two meetings a week. I was not working with a sponsor. But I was sponsoring, oh, you know, it's like, oh, yeah, give away what you don't have. That's ego. That was ego. Will you sponsor me? Oh, of course I will. Thank you for choosing me out of, you know, the minions. I rise above, you know. <laughs> it's just because I gained 40 pounds immediately after I got sober, and people probably thought I'd been humbled, you know. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and... And about two years of sobriety, um, my husband decided to disclose to me that he hadn't really been working a real solid program and that he had done some extracurricular research and that he had basically blown up our marriage. And um, I had no clue. He thought I had a clue. And it was um, the absolutely most devastating thing I thought I could ever experience as a human being. And um, I had a sponsor. She said, it's just your ego, your ego. And I was like, it's not my ego. It is the feeling of betrayal. Is that ego? I don't know. But it was like, my dad did all this. You knew and you still, you know, it was like this blaming, blaming. And um, it was the best thing that ever happened, strangely enough, because I had a choice. I was at the crossroads, man. I saw the fork in the road. Drink, perfectly good excuse. This stuff sucks anyway. Hit your knees, man. Start doing 10, 11, and 12. Start getting back in the middle of AA. Get in the middle of the pack. Quit rotating around the periphery and bitches. Because that's what I've been doing. It doesn't work. You know, two whole meetings. Of course it doesn't work. You know, it's ridiculous. I was, it was like somebody, someone says, you know, I was, I was dying of thirst and I was laying next to a lake. And I was complaining, I'm so thirsty. And people are like, hello, <laughs> you know, lake. And, uh, <laughs> but I'm alcoholic, you know. I mean, I literally see what I want to see. I have a disease of perception and it is, it is fine-tuned. And, I, for whatever reason, I got my big book out that night, and I looked at what you're supposed to do on step 10, 
and I started doing an active step 10 every night. And um, I called this woman that I had just asked to be my sponsor like a week before. And actually, I, didn't call. I went to a meeting that next night, and in the middle of the meeting, they did the summit tradition. And in my head, I thought, F this. You know what? Mm -mm. And I got up, and I never get up during meetings. I, I am a person. I have done it in my life, but I... I've always been so disrupted by you guys doing it. Um, why, but I, you know, I'm not disruptive. I'm very quiet, you know. I'm 5'9", 180 pounds. I think I'm disruptive, regardless of how quiet I am. And I just, I got up and went to the bathroom, and she knew that wasn't normal. And she came in to the bathroom, and I said, uh, here's what happened. And she enveloped me. Um, she had, like, giant bosom. And she was very short. And she just, she went, and it was the funniest, and she like melded around me. It was the strangest thing, and I felt comfort, and I felt safe, and I felt like okay, you know, okay, you know. And she said, "Man, we are going to get through this." She said, "This program is designed specifically for this stuff. You can stay sober." And I was like, "Okay, um, disengage." You know, she was a long hug. And uh, I don't even like the spoon, so you can imagine what I was feeling. Um, I don't like to be touched. But um, but now I hug. I hug because you guys told me that you like it. So, um, so you know, I started doing, I really started living in 10, 11, 12. I tried and tried and tried to meditate, and I still today struggle with that, but I, by God, I do it. Um, you know, I started hitting my knees. I used to sit on the toilet because I was embarrassed to pray. I mean, what if God sees me on my knees? Because who the heck else is in my bedroom with the door closed, you know? <laughs> but I was embarrassed. I was very embarrassed. And when I was growing up in the church I grew up in, everybody would hold hands, and at the end of um, our Sunday school class, everyone was supposed to say a little prayer. And it would get to me, the black hole. And I never once said a prayer out loud. Not once. I never spoke to God out loud. Not once, not once. In nobody's business. If he can't read my mind, then he's not God. You know, that was my whole theory. And, um, but you know what? God doesn't care. Those prayers, they're for me. I, I mean, really, I got, I need to hear what it is that's going on up here in Cuckooville with the committee. And, um, I know I'm really red here. I'm Irish and I also have rosacea. So don't think I'm going to pass out, but I'm really, really hot. But if I take this off, you'll see that I'm really sweating. So there's a whole lot going on here. Uh, still alcoholic. Um, so anyway, I, you know, I upped my program. I stayed in Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, my husband and I, we walked through and persevered. We just celebrated 14 years of marriage. Um, my husband will have 20 years of sobriety, February 5th. And uh, what I, I mean, I'm living a life that a girl like me absolutely has no business living. First of all, I can't believe I'm alive. I'm 42 now. What's up with that? That's a miracle. Um, and secondly, I really am, for the most part, happy, joyous, and free most of the time. And that's a miracle, you know. I mean, that's a miracle, an unexplained event. That is unexplainable. Um, in my sobriety, some very sad things have happened. My aunt, who was a full-blown alcoholic who never had a driver's license, decided to go and celebrate New Year's when I was about two years, three years sober. And she um, partied all night. She got out of this RV and she was homeless. She was living on someone's floor. She'd had three children, and she'd had a life, but her disease had progressed, and now she's homeless, living on someone's floor. And uh, her sweater caught on part of this RV, and the guy was still wasted. He just took off. And she got drugged, but she didn't die until she broke free, and the back of the truck ran over her head and crushed it. And that's what happened to my Aunt Sherry. She died from alcoholism, but her death certificate doesn't say that. And you guys, this woman was a sculptor. And she was beautiful, and she was blonde and blue-eyed and petite and kind. I mean, she was a beautiful woman, and that was my dad's baby sister. And he called me on New Year's Day, and he said, Sherry's gone, you know. And I said, oh, my God, she died from alcoholism. He said, oh, no, no, vehicular something. No, man, she died from alcoholism. That's alcoholism. And my dad, he couldn't look at that because his own father had died from alcoholism just a few years before when I was in college. He had finally divorced his seventh wife, and um, he had been a movie star. He'd been um, in the Lassie series. He was um, Bob Bray, the Ranger Corps steward, and he had hung out with all these famous people and Rock Hudson. Okay. And uh, seven marriages. <laughs> Who knows? Huh? Um, and, um, you know, and he had this phenomenal career, and he lost it all. And at the end of my grandfather's life, he was living in an RV, and um, he picked up a homeless guy. 
and they were trying to work on the engine, and the guy had said, give it gas. It was up on block, and my grandfather popped it into gear because they were drunk. And he, it crushed the guy, but it didn't kill him, but my grandfather had a heart attack, and he died. That's alcoholism, you know? That's alcoholism. And um, just a few months ago, my cousin, Bobby, uh, Robbie, who is maybe three months younger than me, who was ha- he had started having seizures from, like, epilepsy. They hadn't really defined it. He was on medication. Do not drink with this medication. Yeah, right, you know? If it says take one, I take two, because that might work twice as fast or twice as long. But it says every four hours, so I take it in two hours. You know, I don't follow. Directions are there to be interpreted, you know. And um, and so he went fishing, and he drank on his meds, and he was backing the truck into the lake to pick up his boat, and he had a seizure and gave it full-on gas and backed all the way into the back of the lake, and he drowned. You know, he's 40, he was 42 years old. That's alcoholism. And they just keep, and I still got more family members, and it ain't over yet, you know. And uh, that's me if I drink. That's me. But more likely, I'll just keep on going. I'll just keep on going. And I'll end up just this, you know, you, you see them in the stores. There was one standing behind me at Fred Meyer recently. I smelled her before I saw her. Beautiful, beautiful woman at some point. And I thought, God, old lady, back up. And she stunk so bad. And then I really looked at her and I thought, oh, my God, she's my age. Oh, my God. And she's just wasted. And she's all that, you know. She's just so comfortable and, you know. What are you looking at? It's like, I think I'm looking at, you know. I'm doing an arm ask. I mean, it was horrible. And my heart broke. That's me. That's alcoholism, you know. And I'll tell you something. I have stayed in these rooms for a variety of reasons, but it wasn't to improve my conscious contact with God. It wasn't to keep crisp. None of those things. It was absolutely, for me, selfishly, so that I could actually breathe all the way to the bottom of my lungs. That's what I can do in Alcoholics Anonymous. I can actually be here. i got to tell you, man, that that does not happen for me. And if I am not here, I start to get cocky and think somehow I did this. Oh, my God. My disease will say that. You know, you've done a good job. Not bad, this little life. you got a car that works. You live in a nice place. you got a husband. Way to go, Barb C. You put your nose to the grindstone, and we did it. I didn't do this. My best effort got me here. My very best effort. So, you know, I'm here because I'm actually able to breathe. And then, as a result of that, I'm able to be of service. I'm able to be a wife. I actually have had some dogs in sobriety. That was on my fear list. And um, because they bite me, because you you don't lead with the face, you know. <laughs> it's a big deal, you know. And, and I've been bitten five times, and I thought it was the dog's fault, you know. Isn't that so funny? And I used to go around saying, I'm smart, you know. <laughs> no, you're not. You're not smart. And, um, you know, I uh, uh, a year ago, I got diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. And I've been sick for five years, and all these doctors, I tell every single doctor, you know, I'm an alcoholic, I'm in recovery, I'm an alcoholic, I'm in recovery. So, of course, they're like, hmm, you know, are you really sick? Because, and then, you know, do you want some, you know, antidepressant? Do you want a pain pill? And I'm like, and one gal, she said, I'm going to give you this particular drug. You still won't feel well, but you won't care. <laughs> that's, what, that's what an MD said to me. And I, I mean, I'm telling you right now, I wanted to go find Guy down in L.A. And, you know, <laughs> you know what? She works right over there. I was so offended. And, um, I mean, I, I could not believe she said that to me. And the reality is, is that um, I have sobriety. And so I, I just kept going and going. And finally, I got lesions on my brain. <laughs> and now they believe me. And I have all sorts of horrible health stuff. I get to inject myself. I'm an IV drug user now. I'm so proud of myself. So I am cool. And uh, with this medication that it's not minor mood altering, it slows down the progression of, of the disease. And um, and the reality is is that for today, I'm, I'm kind of okay. I mean, I have a lot of stuff that's not quite right, but uh, and I'm not supposed to get hot. <laughs> Whatever. I'll deal with it tomorrow. <laughs> but, um, but the reality is is that I did not have to drink. There is absolutely nothing that I've had to drink over in Alcoholics Anonymous. And three months after that diagnosis, my dog that I got at eight months sober, I had to have my vet come into my home, and I had to lay over this dog, this beautiful 85-pound German short hair pointer named Bob. 
And um, everybody always thought I hated my husband. Your husband, uh, Bob, is he okay? I'm like, that's my dog. You know, that's, I'm yelling at my dog, you know, because he was alcoholic and he never drank. He was a crazy dog, and I loved him with all my heart and soul. And that vet came in, and he put that needle in that dog's arm, and I watched the life go out of that little animal who walked me through all those steps who walked me through the infidelity in my family, who walked me through my diagnosis of MS, who walked me through sponsors going out and people killing themselves and all the crap that happens when life is in session. And he walked me through it. That was that big furry ball that I sobbed into. That was my manifestation, I tell you right now, of God. Because I couldn't bring my childhood God into recovery. I could not do it. That God was not able to handle an alcoholic woman. I couldn't bring that to his feet. But I'll tell you what, someone said to me, just pretend that your dog is the manifestation of God. I'm like, you mean that unconditional love, that acceptance, that furry, yummy thing? And they're like, yeah. And I thought, okay. <laughs> you know, I mean, whatever you guys say, you guys have never led me wrong. And when I saw them take that little guy out on, on the gurney, I sobbed for three days. I mean, I sobbed like I had never sobbed before. And I used to say, oh, my husband's da-da-da. That was the worst thing that ever happened. Oh, no, this diagnosis is the worst thing. No, no, it's my dog. You know what? Life is going to keep coming at me. And I'll tell you what, those things would have kicked me off the periphery if I was just circling Alcoholics Anonymous. But I was right in the middle of you guys. I got phone calls. I got letters. I called my sponsor. I mean, she was going to fly out, but I I couldn't keep them alive. She came two weeks later. She came two weeks later because she wanted to be there for me. She was in Georgia, and she came out to be with me because she knew my heart, part of me had just been put down. <clears throat> so, you know, what you guys have done for me in Alcoholics Anonymous, um, I can never give back to you, ever. Um, the best I can do is stand up here and flop sweat in front of a bunch of people. And, um, you know, we have some laughter. We have some tears. We identify with each other. Um, and, and I know in the very center of my soul that this is my family, that this is my solution, that this disease, I have it. I have it. It's terminal, progressive, and it's patient. And I will not be the one in my family that dies from it. One day at a time, I know I could drink again, but if I stay in the middle of you guys, I do what's suggested, and I just don't take any credit for it, I'm going to be okay. And I hope the rest of you stay in the middle, too. Thanks. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.